Welcome to Profs in the PAV. Preservation through innovation by Professor Neil Bransord, Professor of Ceramics. Global economics and cutting edge technology have transformed ceramics manufacture in North Staffordshire. Neil asks, should traditional craft practices displaced from contemporary production be simply relegated to history or do they offer fertile territory for new modes of thinking and creativity in a digital age? Many thanks for joining me this evening to share insights into my practice and artistic research past and present. For over two decades, my work has mediated transitions within Stoke-on-Trent ceramic manufacturing sector. Following the impact of global economics in the 1990s. It reflects upon the significance of people and their practices affected by these transitions through the fluid perspectives of artistic research. Using a broad range of material expressions, it offers an alternative to traditional text-based discourse con concerning industrial change, commonly addressed by economists, historians, and other academics. The work which I personally frame as provocations and reimaginings addresses the value of craft as an essentially human and necessary component of our creative being. My continued attachment to the past has allowed for a critical interrogation of this history and its future trajectory. So as much as I love museums, I don't see the future of ceramics in Stoke-on-Trent being consigned to one. To set the context of this work, I think it's really important to give you a very brief overview of North Staffordshire's industrial history and how globalisation in recent decades has impacted upon regional ceramic manufacture. Our industrial capacity remains in constant motion, where technological innovation moves at breakneck speed, facilitating reduced lead time through more and more efficient means of production. Today, a ceramic tile made at the Johnson's factory takes less than 30 minutes from raw materials to fired pro product and packaged product, with not one human hand touching the tiles. Back in 1974, 5,000 members of staff at Johnson's were employed to produce 2 million square meters of tiles per year. Today, as less than 300 staff, with the plant producing more than 3 million tiles per week. In the tableware sector, companies who's, who have sustained profits and driven growth have continued to invest in advanced automation to increase output. The volume of ceramics being made in North Staffordshire is now higher than ever before. Whilst these advancements have massively reduced labour intensive manufacturing, my research expo explores a re-evaluation of craft knowledge that once fashioned material objects in particular ways. It poses the questions, should traditional practices displaced from contemporary production be simply relegated to history or, do, or, or, the, or the trails of the heritage sector? Or do they offer fertile territory to unravel new modes of thinking and creativity in a digital age? As many, many of you will be fully aware, the six towns that constitute Stoke-on-Trent have been famed for their industrial scale pottery manufacturing since the 18th century. Alongside pioneers of the Industrial Revolution, such as Josiah Wedgwood and Spode, the Staffordshire potteries in the late 19th century comprised of hundreds of relatively small factories with more than 2,000 kilns firing millions of products a year. By 1938, half the workforce of Stoke-on-Trent worked in pottery factories with employment peaking in 1948 to an estimated 79,000. 
To this day, Stoke-on-Trent continues to be affectionately known as the Potteries, one of the few British cities with a distinctive regional identity that remains synonymous with a, with a particular industry. Yet during the last three decades, escalating global competition has resulted in many companies in North Staffordshire struggling to adapt or compete in both domestic and export markets. Rapid changes in lifestyle preferences, together with increased global competition from East Asia in the 1990s, forced many key factories to outsource high volume and low to mid cost production to these developing economies where energy and direct labour costs were a fraction compared to those in North Staffordshire. This strategy, compared with the advances of production technology, has proved highly detrimental to a phenomenal concentration of human skills and knowledge in Stoke-on-Trent to what was in 1991 a 22,000-strong workforce. From the late 1990s, these commonplace headlines, together with the physical evidence of the effects of, in of the industry's economic downturn, prompted the beginnings of what has become an ongoing process to archive industrial tra transitions occurring across the six towns. This wasn't motivated by nostalgia for past glory or a fetish for ruined porn, where the aestheticization of social collapse eclipses the context of the related trauma. These images were driven by a compulsion to highlight the ensuing effects of globalization from an insider's perspective, whose personal and social ties have been intertwined with the area's histories of ceramic manufacture. Both my maternal and paternal ancestry were employed in the North Staffordshire Potteries. From an early age, a familiarity with pottery terminology was brought about from my grandmother's lifelong employment in the industry, where she experienced numerous skilled and semi-skilled jobs. On the right is an image from 1859, a group of employees who had served a total of 54 and a half years service, with a family descendant, Moses Brownsword, seated on the left. In the centre of the group is Francis Wedgwood, Josiah Wedgwood's grandson. As the industry remained do a dominant employer in the late 1980s, it was perhaps inevitable that I would also follow a similar path. And at the age of 16, I was apprenticed at the Wedgwood factory, where I trained initially as a tableware modeler. This formative period was instrumental to my understanding of the wealth of human dexterity transmitted from generation to generation within e each division of labour, something which I continue to cite throughout my creative practice. However, my return to the Wedgwood factory some 15 years later sought a very different agenda an increased awareness of the displacement of craft practices in the ceramic industry prompted the documentation of many of these transitions as a key element of my doctoral research. Filmed during a period of intense economic restructuring in 2003, nearly 80 hours of raw footage was captured over eight months, providing a unique insight into the industrial tacit knowledge increasingly displaced by technology and automation. Alongside this documentation, I began to salvage the clay detritus residual from each process. As this ephemera made tangible many of the hidden human actions that accrued within each skill specialism. As systems of product uniformity and standardization became the norm with industrialization, any trace of human touch that remained in manufacture was considered an imperfection. Yet these byproducts of manufacture bore within their fabric the physical imprints of the hand, providing a direct connection to the repetitive skills passed down from generation to generation. 
Clay turn-ins, rejected wares and other inadvertent discard were later fired to preserve the momentary imprints of the hand. Materials rescued via this process constituted a work salvage series from 2005, a spatial assemblage flanked with juxtaposing film loops that documented demonstrations of high craft skill against the dereliction and demolition of once prevalent sites of manufacture. Salvage series was not a glorification of an industry an industrial of a distant past where lead poisoning, silicosis and the debilitating effects of poverty were endemic. It set out to elucidate the diverse knowledge and nuances of dexterity embedded in aspects of ceramic production to draw attention to its increasing disappearance. Exploring the physical site of production as a raw material itself was instrumental to topographies of the obsolete. A research project I initiated in partnership with the 2013 British Ceramic Biennial and Bergen Academy of Art and Design. It's involved a site specific artistic response to the former Spode factory, which fell into administration in 2008 and was being repurposed via numerous culture-led regeneration initiatives, rebranding the city as world capital of ceramics. Yet within the regeneration agenda of place, there is often an undue haste for local government and cultural organisations to circumvent the fallout of industrial change in favour of a more sanitised account of recent history. Tackling the complexities of Stoke-on-Trent's post-industrial ceramic situation has often led to charges of wallowing in decline or being complicit in a, a retro retrospective ide idealisation of the industrial past. Yet the core rationale for topographies was to challenge this politicised amnesia and to seek out greater critical discourse to the realities of these transitions and their impact upon people, place, traditional knowledge. Throughout the period of co-leading the project, a total of 97 artists and cultural commentators from 13 countries explored a variety of perspectives and practices to ex examine the industrial ruin globalised landscape of ceramics and the artist as archaeologist. Though working with, a, with such a loaded site, such a spode, participants were inevitably confronted with the ethical dimensions of dealing with its post-production infrastructure and spaces and residual materials. Frequent questions surrounded the role of the artist working in an non-art space, such as do artists destroy the archaeology of a site or do they contribute another layer of production? Or is the artist instrumental to the renewal of such places or merely an apocalypse tourist cashing in on social misfortune with little long-term effect? Although many paradoxes remained, a primary impact to the project was that the funding we raised from the Norwegian Artistic Research Programme sourced local labour to restore and make safe previously inaccessible areas of, for ongoing cultural use. Funding also enabled me to hire and collaborate with a small group of ex-pottery hand painters and the performative installation National Treasure. Companies that had survived the impact of global competition have in recent years capitalised upon factory tourism. In these situations, the reality of social redundancy, mass automation and outsourced production is often obscured by marketing strategies that heighten the cachet of the handcrafted. Today, Many of the high-end ceramic skills that were once the flagship of renowned manufacturers are often regarded as outmoded or economically unviable to accommodate today's rapid shifts in consumer trends. An attempt to elevate the status of these threatened practices 
The primary objective of National Treasure has been to restage the performance of these, um, these actions at a variety of loaded locations. The work has involved the hire of a small group of China painters who remain a senior generation in Stoke-on-Trent whose profession has gradually been displaced by the changing tide of fashion and by ceramic print technologies for mass production. Pictured here is Anthony Chaliner, who has worked as a China painter since the age of 15. Serving as a series of provocations, the painters were set to work in a post-industrial context amongst the wreckage and disorder of the former Spode factory. Separated behind glass as they plied their skills, the viewer is confronted with a situation that evokes both admiration and discomfort. The artisans were instructed to paint on the backs of damaged and discarded plates found on site at Spode with imagery that imitated the 18th century's romanticisation of British ruins through ceramic painting. Though portraying picturesque decay was not the objective here. The spaces within the foot of where a painter would traditionally sign their workmanship were instead graced with images documenting the post-industrial fallout of Stoke-on-Trent. Working within their own time structures for as little or as much time as they wanted, each artisan would occupy these spaces intermittently, dissolving the hierarchical relationships between employer and employee. These vacated but illuminated spaces, together with the residues of labour, extended metaphors surrounding the presence of absence within the work. Ironically, with this outsourcing of people and their skill as a raw material, the ethical dimensions of this process remain paramount. Artisans were hired above their indicated rates of pay and their roles were fully credited within the work. National treasure was not a nostalgic repetition of the past, but a representation of the past positioned in the present that served to renegotiate wider discourse surrounding the cultural and social impact of redundancy following a period of regional industrial change. The opportunity to perform national treasure in South Korea, a country that gives status to individuals with exceptional artistic ability to preserve and nurture cultural heritage, provided a prestigious platform to raise greater awareness of Stoke-on-Trent's endangered craft practices. In UNESCO, in 2003, UNESCO implemented a convention to safeguard intangible cultural heritage. 178 countries have now endorsed this convention and effectively making intangible heritage part of their cultural policy but the UK is still not one of them. As technology has substituted many of these embodied skills, there remains few apprenticeships to secure the effective transfer of this knowledge for, to future generations. The importance of documenting several of these endangered practices became the focus of Reapprenticed a project that set out to artistically reactivate the specialist knowledge of a group of former industrial employees. To gain insights into the transmission and acquisition of these practices, I apprenticed myself to three former ceramic industry artisans in 2013, in 2015, sorry. Uh, these were China painter Anthony Chaliner, flower maker Rita Floyd and copper plate engraver Paul Holdway who remain the last of a generation of master practitioners in their respective areas. The project aimed to illuminate procedural knowledge of each craftsperson's skill base such as the nuances of preparation, material and haptic knowledge, pace and repetitive movement, 
which were all made tangible through both film and object. Each skill specialism was deconstructed to arrest a sequence of actions and touch and craft intelligence that all too frequently remains overlooked. Questioning aspects of work which the artisans often took for granted facilitated detailed insights into know-how and yielded a wealth of oral history which have, would have otherwise been lost. However, finding value in the active memory and knowledge of those affected by change has often led to the charge of nostalgia in a pejorative sense and a eulogising of the, of the past that's out of sync with an ever-changing world. Yet I would argue these first-hand recollections remain essential human narratives that can enrich our scope and understanding of industrial history. Whilst it's correct to guard against false memory, it's equally important that in the process we don't obliterate these kinds of subjective reflection that can reveal insights about the past. Critical nostalgia, as Ray Cashman argues, acts as a powerful force for social reconnection without fixating on loss or the impossibility of return to the past. It can serve in many contexts to retrieve the past for, for support in building the future. Having acquired a basic knowledge of each skill base through this ethnographic approach, I repositioned my role from apprentice to instructor, redirecting the nuances of actions, materials and processes into new forms that were subsequently performed by each artisan. In 2015, the VNA uh, facilitated an opportunity for me to develop a live version of Reapprentice in their Raphael Cartoons Gallery, which holds the Ra Raphael's full scale designs for tapestries that were made to cover the low walls of the Sistine Chapel. Set against the backdrop of masterpieces of Renaissance art, this space provided a perfect context for public engagement with the performance of marginalised factory craft skills, re-choreographed under my instructions to emphasise sophistications of material and haptic knowledge. By positioning fabricators of cultural commodities centre stage, these performances aim to challenge the museum's preservation of object embodiments of craft rather than supporting conditions for the continuation and rejuvenation of such knowledge. This reassembly of collective skill formed the basis of a further project, Factory, which addressed the hierarchies and value systems culturally designated to aspects of North Staffordshire's industrial artisanship through six performances staged at Itcheon World Ceramic Centre in South Korea. The ceramic practices of two ex-industry um, personnel, China flower maker Rita Floyd and mold maker James Adams, were re-choreographed alongside the culturally revered dexterity of four Korean master potters. By subverting and recontextualizing procedural knowledge from both traditions, factory sought to expose a shared language of spatial, material and haptic intelligences to bring into question established hierarchies assigned to modes of cultural production. China flower maker making is one of the few methods of mass production that relies completely upon the dexterity of the hand. With the changing tide of fashion, this industry in Stoke has all but disappeared, with Rita Floyd being one of a handful of master practitioners still practicing who retain this knowledge. Throughout the factory performance, Rita provided an intimate space for the audience to witness the rhythmic intricacies of touch evident within her craft. Yet points of passive spectatorship 
were immediately disrupted by a simple instruction for Rita to continuously discard and manufacture onto a six metre production line built within the gallery. In Korea, I also had the opportunity to work with intangible cultural asset, Kwan Su So, renowned for the continuation of many traditional forms of Korean ceramics. Through the collaboration, Kwan Su produced a series of partially formed moon jars, which were laden with the raw immediacy of touch. James Adams took these casually assembled components into a lesser revered, revered mode of production mold making, which is instrumental to the histories of ceramic manufacturing in North Staffordshire, which paradoxically removed traces of the hand through modes of standardisation. The subtle collision of these distinct traditions attempted to renegotiate a sense of value to people and practices displaced through global economics on an international platform. Artifacts involved in the mechanics of ceramic production were salvaged from various factories in North Staffordshire, which were also presented as a series of formal taxon taxonomies in factory, as a means to reattribute a sense of value to objects left behind following industrial change. What was interesting about these objects was that they were marked by a point in time as prior to the factory's closure, they were deconstructed to prevent subsequent reproduction. And historically, when a factory would become insolvent, design assets such as copper plates and moulds would be absorbed by takeover companies and, con and continued into a form of hybrid production. With reference to this historic process and to expand ideas surrounding the cultural transfer of aesthetics, practices and technologies, these objects were remoulded by Korean master mold maker Sin Yun Cho. And sub subsequently cast in porcelain, a material which traditionally is associated with high status. Master carver Yong Chung Cho and painter Wong John Lee applied traditional Korean iconography to these fragmentary reproductions of post-industrial discard. Continuing the Western Romantic traditions of aesthetic decay and revealing tensions between cultural notions of value and perfection inherited through both traditions. With an awareness of South Korea's geopolitical and colonial histories, and the marginalised status of former artisans from North Staffordshire. Factory attempted to counter hierarchical relations and the politics of othering via collaborative modes of investigation that stimulated reciprocal discourse through the cultural exchange of tacit and, and explicit knowledge. Re reactivating obsolescence through non-commercialised production created a space where the holders of marginalised immaterial heritage could speak for themselves and renegotiate their own value in a cultural context where such embodiments of knowledge are revered, renewed and sustained for future generations. As an open-ended and unresolved work that privil privileges reproduction and re reconfiguration, Factory's various performative components are being expanded in a variety of contexts. The installation of Factory in the project place and practices, which are curated for the, for the 2017 British Ceramics Biennial, reclaim the former Spode Factory as a site of ceramic production that had been earmarked for demolition and re redevelopment. In this post-industrial context, Factory enlisted Rita Floyd and Adams, together with earlier collaborators, painter Anthony Chaloner and engraver Paul Holdway, not to mourn a lost past, but to reveal the unrealised potential of these traditional practices. Through its remaking, Factory offered an alternative model for the continuation, preservation and dissemination 
of endangered industrial skills in North Staffordshire. Prior to the exhibition, the Heritage Craft Association published the Radcliffe Red List of Endangered Crafts, the first research of its kind conducted in the UK, which highlights important aspects of the UK's collective intangible heritage to assess the current viability of traditional crafts and to identify those which are at most at risk at disappearing. Endangered practices such as flint napping to Sussex drug making are listed, but the industrial crafts, particularly those in relation to North Staffordshire's ceramic production, continue to be unaccounted for. This is something I'm currently collaborating on with the Heritage Craft Association to re readdress this imbalance. Yet safeguarding this intangible cultural inheritance doesn't necessarily mean relegating these practices to the dogma of past tradition. One of the aims of a research residency at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 2017 was to explore ways in which traditional knowledge can be transmitted to new modes of thinking, expression and representation. Historic repositories that record, structure and convey know-how from factory production such as pattern and shape books became a primary influence. Using examples held both at the V&A and the Wedgwood Museum, I was drawn to the fragmentary traces of visual and textual instruction recorded with a casual fluidity within these books. Stemming from these points of reference, I started to examine North Staffordshire's early industrialisation and the artistic technological innovations that evolved through this period of cultural borrowing and assimilation. The need to work directly with these objects from this timeline, beyond curatorial handling restrictions, led to me purchasing late 18th and 19th century ceramics akin to those held at the V&A's collection via online auction websites. The slide shows some of my eBay gambling, gambling habits. Rendered with varying degrees of skill compared to their East Asian influences, nuances of painting and print unique to early Staffordshire's ceramic production were digitally extracted from their form using rudimentary scanning procedures. Morphic and fragmentary images established by the rotational and linear movement of objects during the scanning process further distorted imagery typical of Britain's impulse to profit from the exploitation of the exotic via its industrial revolution. The slippage that occurs through the process of the copy, either through limitations of tools, materials and ability, which are prominent characteristics in that period of Staffordshire's rise, to global, rise as a global centre of production, remained a continuous point of fascination. Through this lo-fi form of exploration, imperfections of the digital were embraced as a method to transform instead of replicate. Through further ad ad adaptation uh, using lo-fi image manipulation systems, images became a palimpsest of digital disruptions that were collectively constituted into my own pattern book. To activate this, former spode copper plate engraver Paul Holdway was invited to replicate one of the interlaced images that derived from a historic copy of an East Asian prototype. Returning the immediacy of the digital back to the slow paced tactile material interactions of handwork. In a live performance at the V&A, Holdway offered a rare opportunity to experience the nuances of an industrial craft seldom practiced, where the intimate space of tool, action and matter 
were amplified through a live feed microscopic camera. But skilled practices that have evolved through hundreds of years of ceramic industrialization represent so much more than just the mastery and control of materials and processes. They've shaped the complex social bonds, networks and pride forged through collective skill, which remains integral to the identity of places like Stoke-on-Trent. Transmitting endangered knowledge through new contexts and ways of thinking in collaboration with a senior generation of artisans is just a small contribution to ensure that these industrial crafts continue to be practiced and disseminated. This safeguarding of our cultural inheritance has recently expanded to more tangible forms of overlooked heritage through the multifaceted project Externalising the Archive, which was showcased as part of the 2019 British Ceramics Biennial at the former Spode site. Spode was one of the few manufacturers in Britain to have operated continuously for 230 years on its original site of production. Within 11 of its buildings, there remains over 70,000 moulds that date from 1850 to 2008 when the factory ceased trading. As the site is currently in the process of, it, of regeneration and its buildings repurposed, only a small percentage of this material has been recommended for retention. And as byproducts of ceramic manufacture, molds are rarely valued or, or preserved for posterity. The finished ceramic artefacts has always taken priority over those objects associated with labour. Yet as tools that revolutionise mass production, they can illuminate the evolution of important te technological and stylistic changes in design and industry that remain relatively under-researched. And having been previously trained as a model and mould maker, there potentially exist trials and prototypes within this untapped archive, which may never have seen the light of day since their inception. Working in conjunction with Stoke-on-Trent City Council's archaeology service, a significant volume of contemporary moulds dating circa 2005 to 2008 were removed from the mould stores and installed in the external space of Spode's former Jubilee kiln. Reconstructed to retain their original architectonic pr presence observed within their former environment, the moulds were left exposed to the elements as a deliberate provocation to encourage greater discourse surrounding their impending disposal. The majority of passing public's immediate response was that of wanting to protect the moulds from the effects of the elements, thus by bestowing a, a sense of value to them. The value was further iterated by two loop films in the space, which reconnected the complex dexterities involved within model and mould making and casting methods that utilised in traditional production. The function of this work was to raise questions regarding what we do with such material, as no one can reproduce from these moulds as their intellectual property of the brand belongs to another company. So do we just let this material go to landfill or are there more innovative ways to both preserve and repurpose their sculptural aesthetics? For instance, using them as architectural modules in, in buildings and other structures. Alert to the scale of the disposal issue, externalising the archive also piloted the use of photogrammetry and 3D scanning to create digital surrogates of a selection of mould typologies and shapes as a means of preserving their physical information. The physical environments of four of the former uh, factories' mould stores were also scanned 
and transformed by colleagues here at Staffs University into an interactive tour enabling visitors to navigate their way into previously inaccessible spaces through touchscreen technology and virtual reality. Externalising the archive raised several interesting questions of whether the digital can substitute the physical presence of the site and its materials, which I'm sure most of you will agree it cannot. But it demonstrated scope for the innovative interpretation of heritage, which I plan to build on in future projects to support the digitisation of a much larger selection of mould typologies materials and technologies which can be archived for future cultural benefit and posterity. Since my engagement in the project Stoke on Trent City Council um, Archaeology Service has almost doubled the scale of its retention strategy, demonstrating how artistic intervention can, can influence policy and contribute to the production protection of an endangered post-industrial heritage. To conclude, I just wanted to iterate that our intangible ceramic heritage is not something which is fixed in the past. Our hands help us to think and physical making provides opportunities for serendipity that logic and control through the digital can often inhibit. By colliding digital technologies with the intimate material and haptic knowledge of living heritage, traditions can be reimagined and constitute a new layer of production to North Staffordshire's rich and varied industrial history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil, for this exciting and engaging lecture. Uh, we had some questions from our viewers. If you don't mind, I will ask you now. Uh, the first one is, when public will be able to see your work? Have you planned any exhibition post-pandemic? I have a uh, solo exhibition at the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery, uh, which is called Alchemy and Metamorphosis which opens uh, for the 2021 British Ceramics Biennial this September. Uh, and for the exhibition, I'm curating um, quite an important period of S Staffordshire's industrial history, uh, that transition from craft into industry. Um, so it's partly historic curation, um, but also a body of new work which is utilising some of these new technologies in response to historic objects. Um, it's, it's quite an exciting moment for me to revisit some of this past because that, that tension of pre-industrial ceramics and its shift into you know, the industry and industrial revolution, what we know, that period of the 1720s, just offers a kind of really rich and varied, um, let's say asymmetric um, body of uh, industrial production. Some of these objects have a wonderful vigor and life to them, which I think um, contemporary production has often, often forgets about things. It kind of makes things to the point where they're sterile and dead, you know, to the point of perfection. And these things are kind of full of human vigor and uh, just very kind of lively and interesting objects. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I have a question about the students that you're teaching uh, here at Staffordshire University. Uh, any of them are involved in your work? Yeah, in the last uh, project we held at the BCB, I um, had a um, PhD student who was there involved in the photogrammetry of the work. There's also other members of staff who were brought into the research and contributed um, in numerous ways to showcase their work in response 
to um, North Staffordshire's ceramic history. Um, I think it's essential to engage students in, into this, um, you know, with the past and the future, this collision I think is really kind of interesting um, as a space for them to engage with. Um, yeah, hopefully there will be other opportunities during this project at the Potteries Museum uh, for, for, again, for staff members and other students to um, help out with the project. Um, I know you're working with uh, local schools on, on various projects. Um, how important it is for you to keep that legacy going and, and um, making the students of new generations aware of how important it is to be from Stoke and Trent and, and be in this uh, ceramic, uh, have this ceramic heritage? I think that's a, a really good question because um, over the last three decades, I think people have kind of uh, distanced distance themselves from the heritage. Younger generations of people really, you know, most people would have had family working in different factories. Um, and there was that connection where you knew the terminology of the industry. You know, I, I remember growing up as a, as a kid and knowing what fettling and sponging was and, you know, going to my granny's uh, china cabinet and kind of handling these things which are kind of prized possessions. But there seems to be a bit of a disconnect these days. Um, but I, uh, you know, I ran some projects with the VNA um, again in 2020 through a project called Design Lab Nation, where we worked with four Stoke on Trent schools and uh, we ran projects which engaged them with the raw materialities of what clay is. So we visited sites of industry, historic sites of industry. I took them to um, uh, these Schraff or Shordrucks, you know, the places where um, redundant ceramics would be tipped and we kind of excavated and, and dug up some of the fragments and the, the, the students then were washing them but then were drawing from some of the patterns on the fragments and then making things from these fragments. And I just found it a really nice way to kind of get them connected back into um, the history of place because you know, some of these things can just look like dusty old pots, can't they? But that kind of um, connection with stuff and making and just what I tried to get people to do was take risks with stuff and about, you know, engage with the process and really enjoy that um, fascination uh, of, of just kind of uh, trying things out, really, and curiosity with the material. If you look back at North Staffordshire's industrial past, that kind of early pioneering phase where people weren't afraid to test out anything or try anything. It's such a kind of wonderful period. Uh, you know, these people could make anything if they put the mind to it instead of think, oh no, we can't, we can't do that, you know. Um, and I think it's again, trying to get that risk back into uh, modes of thinking and, and design and innovation really. Um, that's my uh, objective anyway. Uh, you talked about being, um your family working in the industry. Yeah. Uh, so you from young age were privileged to, to, to all this heritage and, and you, you kind of grew around the art. Um, for those people who are not crafty and arty, as I say, um, how would you encourage them to try and, and, and get into it? Are there any classes in Stoke on Trend that you're aware of that people can go and just have a go? I, th I think what's uh, been really interesting in the last couple of years are these community spaces where people can turn up for not a, a, a lot of money. And again, the kind of social events where people just congregate and make things together. Uh, there's one which is held down at the Spode site, which is run by, uh, run by the BCB. Um, and it's just a really lovely energy. It's again, it's not about um, any kind of competition. It's about that pleasure and get an engagement of making things and that connectivity of, of uh, you know, no one's kind of looking over the shoulder and, and saying this is better than mine. It, it, there is a genuine enjoyment. And I think that kind of nurturing of an enjoyment and, and, and kind of thinking through doing is really lovely to watch really. Um, and again, people are coming from different um, perspectives. You know, we kind of mature students often turn to ceramics now because they, they were denied it in a kind of earlier life. 
and they've always wanted to do it and they're coming second career now to kind of um, really engage with this stuff and it's it's wonderful to see them really uh, they do start off with some in inhibitions to kind to, to but they they kind of relax and let go and and kind of enjoy it really it's such, such a wonderful democratic material clay is and and it's um you know people don't realize the diversity of the material um you know from space shuttle technology to hip joints to kind of cups and saucers to medicine you know and I, and i think that um trying to get across that breadth of what the material can do is is what again um, I, I see my role as within Staffordshire University, again, that kind of diversity and breadth of approach uh, to engage a whole range of curiosity. Now, not just cups and saucers, that's still there in the agenda, but a, a lot of, you, you know, there's so many other things which, again, I, I don't think people recognise the full span of what ceramics is. You know, one of the oldest pieces of ceramics is 28,000 years old. So, uh, you know, it's been around for a long time. I don't see it kind of disappearing too soon. Um, we had a question from Catherine. Uh, what work can be done to keep student ceramics in the, um, student ceramists in the area once they complete their studies? Um, phew. I mean, there are initiatives um, such as the BCB, which again has, has championed, uh, you know, the history and heritage of Stoke-on-Trent and also new ways of thinking through that history. Um, I think that's become a draw. You know, we have, um, I think the BCB average is a, a approximately 60,000 visitors every two years to that event. So that's bringing people in into the space and our students are kind of contributing to the BCB. Uh, I think it's a great place to be uh, again, you, you know, in terms of cost. And it's an interesting place Stoke is. It's not been gentrified and polished like most places have. It's still kind of got a rawness to it, which I, I find really fascinating. And I think, it, uh, you, you know, what we're in danger of doing is getting rid of that. But there is that which makes these things interesting. I mean, the geographer Tim Edenser um, talks about kind of the industrial ruin and, you know, this comparison with places like Rome you know, where there's ruins there, you know, don't knock it down. It's part of our history. You kind of embrace it as something. It's, um, it shouldn't be something of shame. It should some, be something which is kind of uh, really important to place in the identity of place. Um, we have a question from Tim, which um, is about your digitization. Uh, so um, he's interested in the digitization and VR side of things. Um, are you taking this further? Yeah, I'm, I'm taking it further with this next project, um, Alchemy and Metamorphosis. Again, they're kind of broad terms, really. I'm interested in the digital metamorphosis. And I, I just showed some slides earlier on where you saw the, the animation of the mold opening. But again, this ability, uh, I mean, on the slide here, there's a, a kind of um, Azerbaijani um, artist called Faig Hamed, who's working with the digital and traditional kind of carpet weavers. Uh, and I, I just think it's such a wonderful kind of uh, expression of past and present. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of, see, I, I was born without the digital gene. I'm kind of absolutely hopeless with the technology. I kind of really fascinated and, and, and you know, want to do things with it. But I, I kind of missed out on that that bit. But by working with people who have that expertise and kind of my, I suppose, full circle working in industry, going off doing what I've done and coming back with a kind of um, outward lens. Um, yeah, just really curious about what technology can do. And I think it's just another, another tool in the toolkit, you know, like a riffler or a chisel. And I think that's the way I see it. It's not the kind of be all and end all. It's something which, uh, you know, technology's there to abuse, to do something interesting with. And I, I think, um, you know, there's this phase of 3D printing, which it's got a bit kind of monotonous and boring. And I, I just think, well, what can we do to kind of disrupt it and make it interesting and turn it into something which has got the risk and, 
you know so these are all kind of questions and I, I see my work really as not as end product it's a kind of process of live research it's something which is continuous it's ongoing it's something which is evolving um, I think that the only end is it is if someone is maybe daft enough to buy a piece of work and then it stops you know <laughs> but I haven't had that problem unfortunately thank you um the great pottery throwdown and we also ha expecting a big kind of change the new movie to celebrate the life of, of Clarice Cliff yeah how do you think how important it is for the industry and for the region that those those shows and movies are are being created I, th I think again it's general audience what it's doing is connecting people like you said who don't really have a knowledge of materials or that history it's connecting them through kind of other media isn't it so you know it can only be a, a good thing in some respects it's it's still um, you know I, I, if I'm honest I, I cringe sometimes when I watch it but you know that's just me but other people kind of love watching it and and get complete fulfillment from it um, it's TV it's great it kind of you know sales of wheels and clay have gone up massively so that can only be a good thing can't it um. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, oh, thank you. That's all the questions we have for today. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone who joined us this evening. Um, Neil's lecture will be available on demand uh, this week at our website, uh, stas.ac.uk forward slash events. And that's where you can uh, get more information about university events, which you can attend online currently. Um, this was the last profs in the path in our spring se series, uh, Creativity is Contagious, and we look forward to welcoming you hopefully on campus in September for our autumn series of profs in the path. Have a good evening.